Hello, how y'all doing today? My name is Charles Jenkins, and we're here today to discuss uh, problems and the solutions of human trafficking, both on a global and local level. And in the studio with me today, from left to right, we have Miss Kathleen Roscoe, uh, Dr. Tommy uh, Grover, and Miss Erin Risby. Uh, but before we get into discussing what we want to talk about today, I'm going to ask you, Kathleen, to introduce the video to us. Sure. One of the first projects we did um, with Hope for the Sex Trafficked is we have a passion for creating more awareness and education surrounding the issue of human trafficking. And so we did a three minute promo video that outlines a little bit about that issue. Okay. So that's what you're going to see. All right. just this thing that can be purchased you know it doesn't help me go to college it doesn't help me have a better life it just shows me that I am worthless it's so easy for us in our comfortable culture, our um, high standard of living, to sort of feel immune from this problem. And we are heartbroken when we hear missionary stories of what's happening in India or in Thailand or in Cambodia, but we don't realize that we are part of the problem. We are part of the demand that drives slavery. This is a big business, it's an industry. It may be an underground industry, but it's an industry. And so looking at trafficking and looking at the economics of trafficking, what is the trafficker's business plan and how do we deconstruct that business plan? Over 27 million people are imprisoned in slavery and sex trafficking worldwide. 80% are female, 50% are children. The United States is not immune to the problem of human trafficking. 18 to 20,000 women and children are trafficked into the US each year from Asia, Eastern Europe and Latin America. And I think there are two parts to this. There's the global part, what's happening to women and children worldwide, and then there's the domestic part, which we have not had enough emphasis on. What is happening to our own children who are being trafficked into prostitution in the country? The U.S. Department of State reports that 200,000 American children are at risk of being trafficked into the sex industry. The United Nations reported recently the human trafficking is a $33.3 billion a year industry. The pornography industry alone makes $97 billion a year. This is big business, second only to drugs and weapons trafficking. Human sexual exploitation and sex slavery would not exist if there was no demand for it. I believe that yes, we can reach out to women in prostitution. Yes, we can reach out to the human trafficking and children that are being in prostitution. But I guarantee you that you, nothing will be taken care of until we reach out to the men. If everybody took ownership of themselves and the environment around them, I think we'd have a better world. Wow, what a video. And we're back talking about uh, human sex trafficking. And uh, Kathleen, before we get into the questions, just tell me a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got involved. 
I'd love to. Um, well, I first learned about trafficking. I thought it was something that existed in other countries that didn't impact us here in America. And I learned about it in February of 2007 was when God really broke my heart for the issue. Mm -hmm. And through various circumstances and just callings and divine appointments, really felt called to respond to it and become a voice for the voiceless in, in whatever way I could using my skill set to respond to the issue where I was at. Wow. And uh, Dr. Grover, just chime in. Uh, how do you get involved with this issue? Call me Tommy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I was working in law enforcement and I had this uh, desire to come to seminary and God married law enforcement career and seminary training. And then I started teaching churches to do the work of the ministry in the criminal justice field. And this is the second leading criminal industry in the world today. Wow. And it became a part of my job to teach churches about the issues that were really impacting our society and our churches. And God showed me that this is breaking his heart because the value of people is much greater than the money that they bring to people who are trafficking them. And so he ruined me to anything else, just gloriously ruined me. And I started teaching on this and really started seeing just specifically what he wanted me to do. And I left my full-time job in ministry to do nothing but this, full-time wow. education on human trafficking. That's awesome. Same question, Aaron. Yeah. Well, I grew up here in Central Texas, and I had the opportunity to go to Nigeria. I lived there for four years working with orphans, and that just really opened my eyes to the need, need to care for children who are vulnerable and at risk. But being back here in the States, living in Chicago and back here in Central Texas, I'm seeing there's a huge need for awareness and protection, prevention, mm. and aftercare with human trafficking. And right now I'm involved with an organization called Noonday Collection, and we are working um, to help prevent human trafficking, and we will share that with you later. I do want to say that Kathleen and myself are both wearing um, beautiful jewelry made <laughs> by <laughs> um, the people all over the world with Noonday, giving them jobs to keep families together and help prevent trafficking. I think that's awesome. Kathleen, you said something earlier about uh, just you learned about it here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit because you're right. When I first hear trafficking, I think some other country. You don't think it's in your backyard, but it's here in our backyard. Yeah, or we think there's a certain demographic that's more prone to it or more more susceptible, and really we're all susceptible. Every um, it, it crosses all social boundaries, mm -hmm. and the wealthier countries, if you're looking at a world map, tend to create the demand, and then the poorer countries, unfortunately, tend to create the supply. Mm -hmm. um, but we're all impacted, and, and, and it was when I learned actually of a young girl's story in Austin who mm. was trafficked um, from Mexico um, by someone who knew her family. It was a trusted relative, a friend of a relative um, that promised her work here in, in Austin, not far from Colleen. And that was as soon as she got here, she was forced into sexual prostitution. And um, yeah, so, and that was just up the road from where I grew up from. So knowing that this was happening in my own backyard really compelled me. I feel very compelled to respond to it, it's uh, take ownership over it. Same question to you, Tommy. How, what's, what does that do for you hearing that, you know what, it's not just a global, I mean, it is a global thing, but it's here where I live. Well, it's easy for us to say, you know, this is a, an issue somewhere else, but we don't recognize in our everyday lives that we're contributing to this by what we buy, what we wear, what we eat, the things that we are participating through labor industry side of this where people are engaged and their fingerprints are on the goods and services, the clothes that we wear and the things mm -hmm. that are a part of our everyday living and we don't recognize that it's a part of our lives. So when we start to take those things into account, we have to understand we all have some stake in this at some point. And when it comes to the sex trafficking side of it, we become a primary driving factor in the mm. global demand for sex tourism. We become the ones who are uh, promoting pornography and sex trafficking, sex tourism, and 
a lot of people think that is people traveling from the United States to mm -hmm. other countries, where in reality, most of the people who do that kind of traveling to have sex with others and children specifically are actually also doing those same kind of activities in the United States. And we hadn't had a frame of reference until about 2004, 2005, when Shared Hope International started studying this in the U.S. context after having studied it in the global context. And what they found was there's just every state in the United States has an issue with oh. children being tricked into the sex industry. The average age for children to get engaged is 13. And so we started to recognize in the mid-2006, 2007 time frame that we really had to redefine this. And we were basing the definition of this on the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, which says that any child who is engaged in the exchange of a sex act for anything of value is considered a victim of trafficking. Mm. If it's an adult, you have to be able to prove force, fraud, and coercion, the three elements that are necessary proofs of someone being forced into modern day slavery. But when it comes to children in the U.S. context, it's real easy. Under 18, exchanging sex for anything of value. And that could be a McDonald's cheeseburger for a really desperately hungry child. Wow. And Aaron, answer this question. I know from watching the video, I saw something that was stunning to me. Sex and pornography, $97 billion industry. Mm -hmm. what, what comes to mind when you, when you hear that, $97 billion? Um, because I've been researching and reading and being a part of it for a, a while is the awareness side of it. Um, it doesn't surprise me because now I can see through a different lens mm -hmm. of what's going on in our culture, um, how sex is so glorified, mm -hmm. how um, relationships are thrown to the left and the right and they're not valued, how families are breaking down all over the place. We have over, over 500 children in the foster care system here in America who are uh, potential victims for human trafficking. We see this uh, all over the world, children whose families are desperate um, and making choices out of desperation. Mm. And so when you get a world view, um, you really start to see this number is staggering. Um, it's absolutely awful, but when you start to see how it could possibly be, mm. you can understand better, wow, our, our world is feeding in to this number, and yeah. there's so much we can do um, to raise awareness, which is what we're doing now, and later in the pro um, broadcast, we'll be telling how we, one by one, can also make a difference. And I want the viewers to know, we're talking about problems now, but we're going to talk about how to, how to resolve some of this mm -hmm. with the That's solutions. Right. Uh, Kathleen, back to you in regards to, I know you're involved with this. Uh, why, why do you think people really need to know, especially parents with, with young children, uh, why do you think they really need to know about this issue? Well, and just to touch on the pornography issue too, I think it's important to understand that it's increasingly growing as well because of the internet mm -hmm. and our access to modern technology. It's at our fingertips and okay. children have access to it. And when we're talking about exploitation through pornography as well, it's important for people to understand that one in five images are of children and they're not choosing to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. And as the demand continues to increase and the drive for, um, it's just like any addiction, it, it, it has to continue to progress. And so yeah. there continues to drive and increase the demand for debase, just more evil, more evil. Um, so it's important to remember that. Um, but I just forgot the rest of your question. Oh, no, you're okay. Oh, we're going to take a little short okay. break here. But when I come back, we'll talk about that. And I know we talked about uh, you having a case in also. In, in Austin, but I want to touch on the local trafficking that's happening right here where we're sitting at in Colleen, Texas. And we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back.
sounds awful. Seriously, awful. But a lot better than last week. Hello and welcome back. We're still in the studio discussing uh, human sex trafficking and uh, we ended with you, Kathleen, and uh, I want you to finish that, yeah, what you were talking about. We were talking about um, modern technology and how it can be used for harm, to harm people and to exploit people, but I would love to share about how we can actually use it for good. Mm -hmm. And there's a national human trafficking hotline number that people can pull out their cell phones and program into their phone, even now, to just have at their fingertips in case they see anything suspicious or out of the ordinary, and it's one 888 Thirty-seven, thirty-seven, eight, eight, eight. I'll give that number again because I want all of our viewers to program it into their phones. It's eight, 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 thirty-seven, thirty-seven, eight, eight, eight. The National Human Trafficking Hotline number. Call if you even have a question or a hint about something that looks suspicious. All right, and thank you for that. Uh, back to you, Toby. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, we talked about Austin, we talked about other areas, but as I mentioned earlier, it's right here in Colleen. Tell us what you know about the story that happened here yeah, in Colleen. Yeah, this is a CBS News story on a fellow named Jerome Cole. And he was just recently sentenced this year to 40 years in prison for child sex trafficking. Wow. He was doing it from Colleen. And he was recruiting kids on the internet. It says that he was sentenced to 40 years in prison for luring girls under 18 into prostitution through a website. And he had an accomplice with him, and agents were able to establish that the photographs of the girls had been stored on his cell phone as well as transmitted on the internet. And as a part of their investigation, this case started in 2011. These cases are very difficult. They take a lot of man hours, a lot of intense time, a lot of computer forensics, and all the things that are on the backside. So you can see, even from 2011 to 2013, we're finally getting mm. a verdict on this guy. And he uh, were, was using inappropriate photographs of the girls on his phone and then using them to transmit messages, text messages, those kind of things. We call that sometimes sexting, sexually mm -hmm. explicit text messages. And the police uncovered the plot after a woman that believed her daughter, who was a runaway, was staying in Colleen and could have been tricked into becoming a prostitute by him online. Whoa. So the average age, again, is 13. And girls can be easily tricked into false relationships. When we got adult men who are tricked into relationships online that are actually false relationships. How easy is it to lure a child who is clueless about somebody on the other end of this? And I want to interject and say something for the parents who are watching this today. I know we want to trust our children, but we have to. It's a must to get on the computer, whether it's Facebook, whatever accounts they're using, and see who they're talking to. Because that can help stop some of this because a 20 However year the man is, shouldn't be talking to a 15-year-old, 14-year-old. I don't care if they know him. Oh, back to what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, it, it's real easy for kids to be tricked. And um, there are programs and educational pieces that are available for parents who need to know more. Um, I do some really intense training on Internet safety because kids don't realize that mm -hmm. they're answering questions that are innocent. Kind of like a child can be tricked into giving answers when they don't know that somebody's actually tricking yeah. them. They're naive about these things. And parents need to know that Facebook is not a safe place, even though kids are getting accounts, you know, there's millions of kids who have accounts. It's a recruitment tool for people who are out there looking for vulnerable children. And vulnerable children cut across all sociodemographics. Mm -hmm. One third of our kids are growing up in homes without a father. And they're looking for looking for love in all the wrong places. And mm -hmm. internet type based relationships can be easy pickings for someone who's looking for a vulnerable child. That's true. And and speaking of being easily lured, I know I don't know if it was two years ago, three years ago, but I was telling you about the little girl 
who the guy told her, hey, you play third base. No, I play first base. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you bat fourth. No, I bat first. You know, just, and he was luring her, trying to figure out who she was at first, but it ended up he went to the house and the parents got wind of it and he got caught. So just be very careful with what your children do and who they talk to. But back to this global, now local, that we know about it, issue that we're talking about, human sex trafficking. Again, we're talking about the problems. Aaron, what are some other problems you, you notice and realize with it? You know, I'm a nurse at a local hospital, and it's amazing to me to see um, all the different reasons uh, the parents will bring their children in, or the broken families, or the lack of resources, or the lack of understanding of how abuse or sex trafficking occurs. And I think that on a local level, um, what we're doing today is providing awareness mm -hmm. that it is happening. That's what we have to know. It happens right here. Yes. It happens in Temple. It happens in Colleen. It happens in Belton. And to not just think it happens somewhere else. And that is the first step. We have got to acknowledge it's a problem and once we can do that and start understanding what to look for and to trust our gut like what I believe Kathleen said if you just sense anything is out of the ordinary um, you're not going to be embarrassed you're no one's going to shame you for bringing something up it's so important to call the hotline or go to the nearest police station and call 911 because all the worst thing that can happen is that you would be a little embarrassed but the best thing that could happen is you could literally save a child's life mm. and save a family and so we are here today just three voices but we are representing what we hope to represent millions of voices around the world who need someone to speak up for them yeah. And kind of like what Ms. Mason was saying, this is a conversation that needs to go on and on mm -hmm. and on. Because mm -hmm. I think, and this may be in proper English, but I'm going to say it, when people, when people know better, I mean, yeah, when people know better, they do better. Mm -hmm. And if people know what's going on and get information about it, it help them. And I see you shaking your head over <laughs> here, Kathleen. What, uh, did you have something to add to what Aaron well, was Well, yeah, talking I mean, about? knowledge is power. I mean, yes. how can you know to fix a problem until you know that there is a problem? And more importantly, how can you fix a problem that you think is on the other side of the planet when it's really in your own backyard? Yeah. And so calling the hotline is a great tool. And we were just talking about Texas, how local this problem mm. is here. And Tommy has some great input on, you know, the I-10 quarter. But we just had this big FBI bust where there were 152 pimps that were arrested across the country. It was called Operation Cross Country. They've been doing it for about seven years now. Mm -hmm. And they got 152 pimps and rescued 106 children, I believe. Wow. And four of those cities were here in Texas. So they had Dallas, Houston, El Paso, and San Antonio represented in that nationwide sting. So good things are happening. And I think it is in part because of citizens who care and are observant yes. and are calling their local law authorities and empowering Empowering them and, and letting every because we all have a we all have a part to play we all mm -hmm. have a role to play so being aware of what that is and then taking ownership and, and doing it and you said something that was key I-10 uh, touch on touch on that for us Tommy I sure the interstate 10 corridor runs from Jacksonville Florida to Los Angeles California Whoa. the entire length of our country in the southern half one-third of it is in Texas one third of the entire span is in Texas. And on that I-10 is Houston, San Antonio, and El Paso. Wow. But it also has that interconnection between 20 because at, off of I-10 is where you catch 20 to go north to Dallas, Fort Worth. Mm. All of those major cities play hub roles in what happens to human trafficking from the West Coast to the East Coast. And we have the North-South infrastructure as well to get from the Mexico border all the way to the Canadian border and it call comes right through Texas. What goes on in Texas as far as human trafficking doesn't stay in Texas. We play a major hub in the transit of people, but it goes through all of the United States, all the way from New York, Buffalo, all the way down to the Mexico border. And I've heard, I've heard a couple of statistics, too, that communicate that one in four victims that are eventually rescued here in the U.S. have been in South Central Texas at one time because of its proximity. And we know we have the I-35 corridor as well that goes north and south, right, you know, up 
up to Canada. So um, that's a huge part of it. And um, I think I forgot the other statistic. No, I want to touch on that. Um, this past year, the Bell County Sheriff Department has partnered with the Austin Human Trafficking Task Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Sheriff Department, they're the ones who are on I-35. Mm -hmm. And they are really learning what to look for, you know, doing random traffic stops. Um, they're being educated. And so we're just so thankful for our local um, police force and people who really care in um, this area who are making a difference and making an effort, spending the time to get trained. And so that's something that's so huge too, is recognizing that what you said about this gentleman who was, um, is now in prison, I believe, mm -hmm. for that, for what he did, um, that people are working so hard, but it doesn't, it, it just takes everybody to speak mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. The state of Texas really leads the nation in a lot of new laws that are changing the way that we look at this. Mm -hmm. And one of those came out of the Office of the Attorney General's recommendations to the legislature in 2011. I've served on the Office of the Attorney General's work group for law enforcement education. Mm -hmm. And the legislature mandated training for law enforcement. And so I do that training and it helps officers to have a new frame of reference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they've actually, through the Department of Public Safety, had a special grant through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And before they started this training for street interdiction, which is much like we used to do in old drug trafficking interdiction, they had no fines of victims of human trafficking. And that was like 2008, 2009, they were looking at statistics. They had like almost three million traffic stops. They started doing this training for law enforcement so that they could recognize what they were seeing on the street. And they had in the 2011 report more than one victim a month that they were finding because they had had wow. specialized training in what street interdiction looks like for wow. people who may be trafficking children and or a child that they found in the car. Wow. So it's really taking um, that effort by the government, by updating the legislative you know, needs and the mandated training, as well as getting it into the hands of street level officers who recognize it yeah. and can begin to take action. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting to see Texas lead the way on making a difference about this issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, after people watching this today, you know, my antennas are going up now because, you know, I. Like you, Kathleen, in the beginning, I just thought it was mainly a global thing. And then when you say Colleen, I'm like, it's right here. Mm -hmm. You know, that, it, it tugs your heart and mm -hmm. it, it hits home. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to be aware and, and do something about it. That's even right. if it's a false, you know, yeah. even if it's a false, call the 800 number. They won't, yeah. yeah. They won't turn you away. They'll take, they'll take your number down and, yeah. And I think it's important that we take some of the pieces that we've talked about. Child sexual abuse mm -hmm. is a natural setup for being engaged and being easily tricked into a relationship that mm. seems like something it's not. And child sexual abuse plays an important role in understanding kids who have been trafficked. More than 80% of them say that they had been sexually abused as children. And in fact, the amount of sexual abuse is an indicator for how easily children can get into this. Whoa. It's almost the same percentage as women who have breast cancer in the United States. Whoa. It's somewhere between 10 and 25 percent of our kids who will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday in the United States. And that means we're setting our kids up for engaging this way mm -hmm. and our whole toxic culture really feeds it. It's like a perfect storm that our kids are living in between technology and internet and the phones and sexting and child sexual abuse and all of these things push them. Mm -hmm. it's the push-pull factors mm -hmm. are huge in this, this generation. Well, Tom, we're going to end on that, and I know we've been talking about the problems a lot, but when we come back from this short break, we're going to talk about some solutions, some tangible solutions that people can use to help uh, prevent this and just take some steps to making it happen the right way. Nothing makes you smile like a trip to Victory Lane. But for millions of children, that smile is impossible. Severe tooth decay often causes children to hide their smiles. They're unable to eat, sleep, or pay attention in class because of the pain. Hi, I'm Greg Biffle. I'm teaming up with 3MSB, Henry Shine Cares, and the American Dental Association to give kids a smile. 
Through this national volunteer program, we're working to host free dental clinics for children, deliver much needed treatment, and provide dental education to kids and their families. As a new dad, I want to share these recommendations from the American Dental Association for your children. Brush twice a day with fluoride toothpaste. Floss once a day. Eat a balanced diet and avoid sugary snacks. Visit the dentist regularly. Let's put kids in victory lane for good dental health. It's time to yeah, give yeah, kids a smile. Yeah. Visit Give Kids a Smile on Facebook to support this important program. KPLE TV is a 501c3 charitable organization. Your pledges of support help keep us on the air. Will you prayerfully consider giving a tax deductible gift to this ministry and becoming a partner with Central Texas' only local Christian television station? Uh, welcome back. We're here talking about a great topic, uh, human sex trafficking. And as I mentioned before the break, we're going to talk about some solutions now. And we're going to use a little acronym, PEER. It stands for Prevention, Intervention, Education, and Restoration. And all of those are talked about in Dr. Tommy Grover's book, Compelled. But before we talk about the book, we're going to talk about some prevention. And I'm going to start with you, Kathleen. Yeah, I think the first step is what we're doing right here, is having a conversation about it, we're dialoguing about it. And one of our partner ministries that I love dearly is Liars and Posers. So we referred earlier to tech, modern technology and how do you work, especially towards prevention for our vulnerable youth, our, our at-risk teens, um, our runaways, people who do come from broken homes. Mm -hmm. How do you equip them to not become a victim and to prevent it from happening to them? And so they have a great program where they, they do an education program where they educate the youth on exposing how Facebook is used as um, just a facade and that liars will little, literally get on and do exactly what you mm. said earlier. So I think just removing the veil, helping people identify um, what to look for, um, that's key too, to be able to identify what, to, what looks suspicious. But I think just knowing how they're vulnerable. And I think I've had, we interviewed one girl one time and she said, honestly, if I could tell parents one thing to help protect their own kids from becoming victims, to prevent it in their own family. Again, we're talking about tangible things we can all do in our own homes personally. So if we have kids, grandkids, what can we do? And one is to just continue to show them how much they're loved, they're mm. valued, their intrinsic value because they're created by God. And to just let them know that they always have options, an open forum, that there's nothing they can't talk about with them. Yes. And to continue to seek God in their practices of parenting them in godly ways. And prevention really has to include preventing the demand. Mm -hmm. Because if there wasn't a demand, there wouldn't be this supply line that just keeps being filled up by mm. vulnerable children. Preventing exposure to sexual abuse, preventing exposure to pornography. Pornography, again, we talked about that earlier, but it's like the jet fuel that mm -hmm. you know makes this rocket go. And the target audience for pornography is 11-year-old boys to get them engaged in pornography that's free. It's highly sadomasochistic. And there's a lot of information available to parents about how easily accessible pornography is. In fact, I don't think kids have to go looking for mm -hmm. pornography. It comes looking for them. <laughs> and they're mm -hmm. really targeting our children at younger and younger ages. And their exposures are very high because of the technology. So we've got to put some filters and some monitors in place to prevent their exposure and to prevent the demand in their hearts from being ex expanded mm -hmm. because children are not fully developed in their frontal cortex in their brain until they're about 25 and so when they see porn it really short circuits what God sent them here and how he sent them here to engage in sexuality so we've got to prevent and prevent the demand and that's a big part of it. But I want to s mention something that we haven't mentioned so far, and that's the need to be in prayer mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we're going to talk specifically yeah. about prayer. But I believe prayer is the hardest of all the works in this, and it's a part of the prevention piece. We talked about I-10, and we've had a prayer initiative that started on October 10th of 2011. It's called 10 at 10 for I-10, and we're praying for that whole I-10 corridor. Mm -hmm. And it's been amazing to watch the stories of God's intervention mm -hmm and his uh, potential prevention of people getting engaged with sex trafficking because of the people who have been praying about this mm -hmm. issue. 
it's exciting to see him intervene that way. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And I want to, oh, uh, it's over here, prayer. <laughs> and it, you know, power release anywhere you reside. So you could be here, you could be in Timbuktu, you always can pray. Mm -hmm. And to you, Aaron, prevention, did you have anything to add? I would like to say, I think it's a really good um, opportunity for churches to really have conversation yes. in the churches mm -hmm. with the right. youth groups. Mm -hmm. um, all, all youth are not trusting, but I, I think that really Christian youth may be a bit more trusting of people because they are surrounded by um, hopefully very healthy people in their environment at home and at church, and that is a broad statement. But I will say that um, growing up here in Temple, I had absolutely that, no idea this was happening here, and I was in a bubble. And um, it would be really great for churches to have a conversation, to raise awareness with parents, to raise awareness within the youth and the children about what to look for and how to prevent it mm. from happening to them. You know, about child sexual abuse in the church, there's a ministry that I work with called ministrysafe.org, and it helps oh, to okay. filter. But what they're finding out is that the majority of risk is within the church, mm. and that the peer-on-peer -peer interaction and the hypersexualization of children has really created a new dynamic for churches that they need to be aware of. Mm. They need to start teaching the parents and the children right. about how to interact appropriately, and then they become a mobilizing force in their right. community as well, because if we're gonna do prevention education mm. in the church, then let's educate the whole community. Mm. Let's right. really take it to the streets, and I think that's a way that the church could actively engage in prevention that will help to put roadblocks, if you will, of kids getting engaged and right. possibly being sexually abused. Right. And going back to that statement, when we know better, we do better. Mm -hmm. And I know there are kids who are vulnerable, just like you say, you know, I work in foster care and seeing kids after they graduate who still don't, you know, don't have a clue of what's going on. They become so vulnerable and I can see a guy walking up to him and say, hey, here's what I have for you and them falling into sex trafficking. So it's real and it's here in our backyard. Uh, did you have anything else about would, prevention? Yeah, I would love to add, uh, just to, to piggyback off of the church thing, I don't think there's any other organization more strategically mm -hmm. mm. planted <clears throat> on the face of the earth to respond to this issue in an effective way. I mean, you even mentioned foster care, like yeah. churches taking foster care kids under their wing and really mobilizing their church to become loving, godly, adoptive homes to mm. some of these kids, taking them off the streets. That's also preventative care. So I do feel like prayer is one of the biggest, most effective and easiest ways to respond to this issue and then mobilizing the church and getting them on board too. And you know, and since if there's someone out there watching and say, well, we can't make a difference. Yes, you can, you know. I know it's a global issue, but we can do it one person at a time, mm -hmm. one church at a time, it can be done. Uh, anything else in regards to prevention? Moses was one. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Moses was just one, but what God crea you know, created within Moses' life to tell him at the burning bush was, from Exodus chapter three, I'm seeing what's happening. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing the cries of the children. It gives me God bumps mm -hmm. just thinking God is letting us in on something that he is really broken hearted about. Mm -hmm. And he is compassionately responding. Who did he say his compassionate response was? Moses. That's right. He says, I'm sending you. And then Moses is like, oh, I got all these sorry excuses about why it's not me. I'm not going, uh -uh, I don't speak too good, I stutter. You know, and all of that. And when he got finished giving all of his excuses to mm. God, God sent him to the elders, the church. And they went to the desert for three days to pray and to fast, to hear God. What is it that God wants us mm. to do? We don't own everything, but God is calling us to respond. We're his A team. He doesn't have a plan B just like evangelism. And when we look at the, the biblical message, when Christ unveiled his ministry and opened the scroll from Isaiah 61, he says, this is why I've come, mm -hmm. to set the captives free. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if we don't take that seriously, that this is the issue of our day where God is seeing, he's hearing, he's compassionately responding, he's calling us, We've got to give up all of our sorry excuses and get on board. I get a little passionate when Amen. I think about that. Amen. <laughs> because we, we've, got to, we've got to get in the game. Mm -hmm. He's responding and he's going to use his A team to do it. I think all of us have been gloriously ruined to this. Mm -hmm. We can't not do this. Compelled. <laughs> Compelled. Compelled. That's right.
And that's a part of what the story is. God is compelling a response to this. It's checks in Exodus chapter three, verse 19. When they go pray, God says while they're on their way to Pharaoh, by the way, they're not gonna let you go unless a mighty hand <laughs> compels them. And that's exactly what God's doing today. Mm -hmm. He's compelling a response. If we wanna be in on the experience of who God is right now in our society, we have got to respond to this issue because the value of humanity is at stake. Our kids are not sent with price tags. They're sent stamped with the image of the invisible God. Mm. And they are priceless. Mm. And unless we take that stewardship of humanity and the stewardship of our children seriously, we're never gonna make any changes. We can talk about prevention and intervention and all of that, but we've gotta know our why message. God is compelling a response. I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome, and I loved it. And I know we talked about prevention. Now we're going to talk about the I, intervention. Yeah, intervention is very similar to what we've said a lot as far as being able to intervene into the situation, be, have our eyes open to some what some of the risk factors are, intervene in that foster care's mm -hmm. uh, child situation at home, the abuse situation at home, seeing something a little bit that doesn't seem right in your neighbor's house with the shutters always closed and yet you've seen a young girl every once in a while coming in and out. Um, just the red flags, being mm -hmm. able to plug in that phone number, the National Human Trafficking Hotline number, and call and just say, hey, there's something not right going on, and looking at license plate numbers and everything that you can Well, for the intervene. people who just walked in and catching us on TV right now, what's that number again? Oh, I will give it to you. It's 888-3737, <laughs> 888, the National Human Trafficking Hotline number. But let's not confuse intervention with becoming Liam Neeson, like on the movie right. Taken. Right. Because yeah. this is vigilance, yes. not vigilanteism. Mm -hmm. We are not gonna take it to the street and do anything <laughs> disruptive for law enforcement. Because we could find ourselves in a very bad place. Mm -hmm. Because the people who are traffickers have the methods, the means, mm -hmm. the mentality, and the money to do things to you that you don't want done to you and you don't have a right to take this into your own hands. So it's really important that we help people to be vigilant and to, to go to the human trafficking hotline to figure out what those clues and cues are because there's a whole list mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. We could give you, you know, what scars, marks, tattoos look like, what kind of scenarios that you might see in an emergency room situation, but we want people to be vigilant about who their neighbors are mm -hmm. and what's happening there, not yeah. become you know, we're not and, there. and we don't want okay. people to have to feel like they have to go somewhere or do anything. It's like just being where you are and impacting your Hello and we're back uh, to discuss human sex trafficking and uh, I ended with you, Aaron, and I'm going to start with you again about, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, education. I know we've been talking about different ways to educate people about what to do, but share your thoughts on it since you are a nurse and you have some good advice to give. Well, what's so great about um, education is that there is no lack of resources available. When I started about five years ago researching what's happening here in America, what's going on with children and at-risk kids, I was seeing there is so much information so that you can be aware, you can be involved. And so to not be intimidated, but if you can just start looking, then God will lead you to how he wants you to specifically be involved. But it's such a great thing that now um, it's not only a uh, something that's happening worldwide, but we are also finding out about it, and we have the tools and the resources to do mm -hmm. something. And I love this last one, restoration. I think it's a beautiful word. And so if you can each touch on restoration, and then we'll get some final thoughts and what about, so, uh, sorry about that, restoration. Restoration, no, it is a beautiful thing. And I think it, as, as dark and evil and grotesque as this issue is, I think it is really important to remember that we serve a God that's who right. is about resurrection and restoration and redemption and rehabilitation. And that's why as dark as this is, we always have hope. There's mm. always hope. And it that true healing and true fulfillment to, to, to come to that place of completion and restoration because we know it is a long journey, sometimes a life 
lifetime journey, mm -hmm. um, but God does it. And when we are able to put the right people in place with the right tools to surround the right individual at the right time, then that restoration can happen. And that's our hope. That's why we do what we do. That is our hope to see Christ reach out and redeem and restore and use us as tools to bring that's that awesome. about. Yeah, I used to say what she said, yeah. you know, there's no lack of resources. <laughs> and if people want to know yeah. what it is that they're looking at, it, all I got to do is go to the hotline or mm -hmm. start, you know, Googling it. I've got my website, trafficstop.org, and it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. But what I realized what was missing was why? Mm -hmm. mm. Why do we need to respond to that? And I think that's a part of what God had me write compelled about because he was compelling a response in me and he's compelling a response in his church and he is compelling a response that people cannot say no to. And when people understand why they respond to this because God's calling them to respond to it, then there's a different motivation about mm -hmm. it. And all the resources in the world um, at our fingertips has to be organized in a way that we can just really say, okay, this is my piece. This is what I really compassionately am responding to because God has called me to this and this is why. And then I realized that there, it's so big, like what, you know, when you talk about the video, it's just, it's so big, 27 million people on, on a global scale. It's just, I, I can't, it's like drinking from the fire hose. I can't yeah. take it in, you know? And so that's when God had me start teaching on the peer prevention, intervention, education, and restoration, because those four platforms really become a standpoint for people to say, oh, well, I can do prevention like we talked about, or I can do intervention by standing up back in my community and saying, you know, no more sexually oriented businesses are allowed here. Well, let's really do something about that. And the education piece, every one of us can teach other people about this as we learn about it, even just like the gospel message. You don't have to know everything about mm -hmm. what the Bible says. You have to know that it's affected your life and that you want other people right. to be affected by it too. And then the restoration piece, absolutely. The, the hope of the gospel is all intertwined with bringing people out of their bondage. We all have our bondages, mm -hmm. right. but how does God affect us? We want people to feel and to know the restoration that we've had. So yeah. that's a part of why the book and how we can get engaged on it. And then the hope is really honoring God with what we're doing mm -hmm. and really making sure that we know the rules of engagement and how we can do that. And speaking of compelled, uh, how can people get a copy of it or you have a website? I do have a website, TommyGrover.com. That's where the book is available, but it's also available on Amazon if people want to get it there. It's available as an ebook, which is really friendly because every hyperlinked URL website is linked in the ebook and this thing is full of learning places, places you can go on the internet videos you can watch, learning, engagement, and all kind of resources in there. That's the educator in me. I can't not give you the resources. <laughs> no, nah, you are good. <laughs> it's, uh, any thoughts about restoration? Um, restoration is absolutely key. It's a part of who we are as believers. We have been redeemed, and it's our role to bring redemption and reconciliation to children, to families, and like what you said, we don't have okay. to know every single thing, but we we know enough, and now the, the viewers know enough, and they can um, be a change, make a change. How does the jewelry do that? Um, I, with Noonday Collection, which is from Isaiah 58, when you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, um, you, your light will shine like mm. the noonday. Oh, that's and awesome. noonday collection, um, our desire is to provide sustainable income for people all over the world to keep families together, to keep children within families, mm. to prevent human trafficking on a very basic preventative level. Um, we have a catalog, we have a website, all of our pieces are made by our artisans, um, handmade from 10 different countries, over a thousand artisans are represented within Noonday. And why that's so important, it's not only the artisans, it is uh, all their families and their communities. Mm. And we're providing hope and dignity through sustainable 
um, economy, through education, through working with their hands and keeping families together. So all of this beautiful stuff is handmade and Whoa. that's a way right here locally that women can get involved by purchasing products like from Noonday Collection or Fair Trade Organizations, making uh, using their purchasing power to make a difference in the world, to know where the products are coming from, that it's a really good working environment. And that's one very practical way we've been talking is how can we make a difference? Mm -hmm. Know what you're buying, know who you're supporting, and Noonday Collection wants to do that. And I live here in Temple. I am called an ambassador <laughs> for our artisans because I'm a voice for them while they're overseas and working to make these beautiful products and what we're doing is we're trying to prevent human trafficking from the ground level keeping children with their families mm -hmm. and keeping families together and that's right guys I'm a guy and I'm looking at this stuff <laughs> it is beautiful <laughs> <laughs> you know I want to mention on the home front mm -hmm. restoration is one of the key calls that God has implemented for mm -hmm. people that I know in Texas and I tell a couple of the stories of people who've been ruined to respond in the restorative area and there's a group in East Texas that's developing a house it's called Refuge of Light there's a group in the uh, College Station area that's got the Triumph House, it's Traffic 911, and there's a group in Austin called Restore a Voice, and then the youth, the Freedom Youth Project, mm -hmm. which is in San Antonio, it's always Freedom First, mm -hmm. and uh, they're working on developing uh, homes for kids who don't fit into the foster care system, who don't fit into the juvenile system that we have because their needs are so, so great. Medical, physical, emotional, psychological. These kids have traumas with a capital T mm -hmm. like soldiers coming back for more. So there's some restorative work that's happening right here in Texas. And I work with Abolition International Shelter Association. So we've been doing some education to try and make sure that we have standards of care across the country. We've done some work with Wellspring Living in Georgia. There's a lot of ways that mm -hmm. if people want to get engaged mm -hmm. on restorative care mm -hmm. that they can do that right here. They don't have to go right. across the world. They can do it right here in Texas. Mm -hmm. Wow. We have about four and a half minutes left and I know with talking about everything we talked about there's something I missed. So if I'm if you feel I missed anything just chime in and let us know you know anything about human sex trafficking that you feel I miss? Yeah, just I just want to leave our viewers with the hope that they can take action, that they mm -hmm. can take ownership over this issue, that they can, like we mentioned earlier, pray. That's mm -hmm. one of the hugest tools and ways to respond. They can partner. Mm -hmm. They can partner with Hope for the Sex Trafficked, with Traffic Stop, Tommy Grover, or with Aaron Noonday, host a trunk show. So there's lots of real tangible ways that people can get involved to pray, partner, or to participate. We mm -hmm. love it when people volunteer or want to participate in any way to help with education venues, travel, the, the New Day collections. And I love it too when we're just able to edit programs together or get more awareness out or go to a speaking event. And um, one of my hearts too in all of this issue is realizing that there does need to be like a collective coming together of not just the body of Christ but, but and believers all over on this issue, but all of us, everyone mm -hmm. responding to this issue, knowing the right hand what the left hand is doing. So networking with in your own community and, and she's mentioned Freedom Youth Project and Liars and Posers in San Antonio. There's also Sla San Antonio Against Slavery. Just knowing what's going on in your own city. You've mentioned the task force in Austin and Bear County has one, the South Texas Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Being aware, edu part of educating yourself is not just on the issue, but what's going on in your own area that you mm. can get involved in to help respond to this issue. We have three minutes left in a minute and a half. <laughs> a minute and a half. Share your final thoughts. Yeah. Mm. I'm really excited to see God at work. Mm. Uh -huh. And I'm excited to see his body responding to him being at work. Because all of us want to experience God in our lives. And we have experienced the kind of redemption that says there's more to experiencing who God is if we will actively engage on what he's about. Mm. And I think that in my 30 plus years of ministry, I have never seen a more clear indication of God's active, compelling hand about an issue as this one. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. It's an adventure. It's exhilarating. Yes. It's excruciating, <laughs> especially when we don't have paychecks to yeah. go with it. You know, it's like, okay, God, we're all in, but we're expecting that 
Yeah. He's right there and mm -hmm. he's providing for us. Hebrews 13, five was the verse he gave me. He said, learn to be content and I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Mm -hmm. And it's written in the present imperative, which means I'll never, ever, never, ever, never leave you, nor will I never, ever, not <laughs> ever, never forsake you. <laughs> and it's pretty exciting to see God work it out. That's mm -hmm. right. Aaron, final thoughts. Just want to encourage our viewers to not live lives in fear. A lot of what we talked about today can be used by the enemy to be twisted, to mm. be a fear-based fear response. Yeah. Mm. But what we, our role is to, through the Holy Spirit, to empower, to enable, to educate. And now the viewers have an exciting responsibility to whom much is given, much is required. We've been given so much. Mm. We can sit at our tables and not fear gunshots coming through the window. Many of us have three meals a day. Many Many of us know where our children are at night, but to understand that we don't live lives of fear. All of us are very involved in this issue, but we are free and we are ambassadors for Christ and it is an honor to be involved in the issue of sex trafficking. Well, Kathleen, Tommy, Aaron, it's been a pleasure today and I want to take the time to say thank you for what you're doing. I know sometimes it can get a little tough but I encourage you guys to hang in there because you are making a difference. So thank you all for being on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor. And thank you, our viewers, for tuning in uh, and learning more about human sex trafficking. That's our show for today, and we are out.